this is Nina Perez at Straight Talk, No Sugar Added. Thank you so much for watching. This show is created to give you resources, tools, and tips, and to speak about life topics to challenge and transform your thinking. So today I'm very excited because I have an organization here that I'm truly in love with, and they were here for my very first episode, and we are here back because now they are back from their trip to the Dominican Republic and to Tillery, Haiti, and we are here to discuss all that is going on with the 900 Project. So I want to thank you guys so much for being here. So today we have Sherry's with me again. Yay, yes, Sherry! Thank you. We got Matt Pacey here and Justin. Hi, Justin. Hi. Welcome. So I wanted to bring you back on because in our first episode, we talked about the 900 Project and basically the roots of the 900 Project. And I know that you had started it for the latrines, right? And I always get this number wrong, but I think it's 1268. <laughs> Am 86, I wrong? but ah, 86. you got the right number. It's my dyslexia. I can't help <laughs> no, it. No, it's so. <laughs> so um, the, we had discussed about how they had a outbreak of um, cholera mm -hmm. in Tillery, and when you were on this trip with uh, Black Rock Church at the time, you guys started to feel like there was more that you can do for this area in Haiti called mm -hmm. Tillery. And as you were driving through, um, I remember you telling this amazing story as you were driving back from Tillery, how all of you pretty much decided that we need to do something about this, right? Something mm -hmm. has to change. And you went back to uh, Tillery and asked, I guess, the pastor there, mm -hmm. yeah. what is it that they need? And the thing that they needed, which we take for granted, are bathrooms, mm -hmm. really, right? So you um, decided that you were going to commit to doing 900 latrines. Thus, the 900 Project <laughs> was yes, born, same. right? Yep. And is that why the name came about? Is that literally why? Because of the 900 latrines? Yes. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. So then when you did the 900 uh, latrines, which ended up being 1286. Perfect. Ah. There you go. <laughs> you <laughs> um, it. it was pretty amazing to me. I had the privilege of going with you um, in August. And what I loved about it was that when I spoke to the pastor um, that you connected with in the DR, he was telling me that they were really seeing an increase of, of people passing away from cholera in Tillery mm -hmm. um, in 2012. And me and him had a very extensive conversation about this and I was so drawn and he was telling me that um, it was like maybe, was it like two or three years later that they no longer had people dying of cholera, mm -hmm. which is, Wow, right? Like that yeah, must absolutely. blow your mind. Yeah. yeah. It must really blow your mind because when you think about it, you were just driving by and decided let's just do something about it. But to eradicate something that is killing people, that's a whole different thing. You know, that's like another mm -hmm. level, right? So that's why I wanted you guys here um, because I thought that what you guys are doing to me is pretty amazing and impressive because you're not just going to give somebody like a bag of food and saying, hey, good luck next time, mm -hmm. but you're actually on the ground with them and then helping them with their future or moving forward, right? So I wanted to um, introduce the 900 Project that way, but I also wanted you guys to introduce yourselves and just have the audience know who you are, and what are you a part of in this organization, and uh, why are you even a part of it? Why, why bother doing this? So if you want to give us a little about yourself, that'd be awesome. Sherry, you want to sure. start? Uh, yeah, I'm Sherry Pacey, and right now I just went back to school. I'm a teacher, I'm a wife, uh, also a mother as well, but um, besides all that, the 900 Project is just so dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. I love the trips, I love just preparing and, and doing the organizing and just communicating with the people in the Dominican and Haiti. So it's just something that I think when we got married, we never thought we would be a part of, but uh, just struck something in our heart. Mm -hmm. And um, when God starts something, it's just an amazing journey. And we really had no idea that the cholera was so bad. And we were just kind of taking our team and, and listening to God. And it was amazing what God does with with your obedience and yeah. it's been it's been a, a great a great ride yeah i bet i bet it's been a ride yeah because <laughs> it's For not sure. easy it's not easy to start an organization first of all yeah. right but now you're doing it from across the country, across <laughs> the globe right yeah. so that's a little bit harder but that's that's wonderful um I'm, and i'm glad that you had it in your heart to do that so matt what about you um yeah so i'm matt pacey i'm sherry's husband um I work in, in finance when I'm not working for the 900 Project. Um, 
And so pretty much by default, I do the finances and the paperwork mm -hmm. and all that stuff for, for, the, um, for the project. So using your um, tools and talents. Yeah. <laughs> it was more so by default that nobody else wanted to do that stuff. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I guess <laughs> there's my strength. role. Right. My role was set before I uh, even volunteered for it. Right. Um, but it is, it has been amazing. And honestly, once we finished the latrine project, we kind of thought, hey, look at the work that God did. Yeah. And, um, yeah. You know what are we going to move on to but God was like nope this is going to be a what seems to be a, a lifelong project now right it's pretty much going to be the project our boys take over and they're right. four and two so mm -hmm. when they grow up right their so roles you're are in this for the long well. haul is what you're saying it's a lifelong mission yeah what did you think of um the fact that they were asking for latrines like wh what was the thought process behind that right because it's one thing to to say, oh, we need food, it's a kind of an easy one, right? Because mm -hmm. you say, okay, we'll just go and buy food or we'll hook up with an organization that has food, right? So what do you do? Like, what's even the thought process behind, how do we dig, you know, 1,286 holes or 900 holes, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, did you, what were, what were your thoughts? I'm just curious. Honestly? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of the two of us, I'm certainly the more skeptical one yeah. with things like that. And so, like you were saying, when we were on the bus and everyone started talking about, you know, how we need to do something to help, um, I think I was kind of fake napping in the corner yeah, yeah. under the air conditioning of the bus <laughs> to be like, this is insane. <laughs> we're gonna, My wife we needs don't, to be We quiet. don't live here. <laughs> yeah. How are we going to build a bunch of bathrooms in Haiti? Yeah. We yeah. don't live here. We're here for what? Mm. Typically, when you go on the trip, we were only there for a couple hours, and like that was it. It was a quick visit, and uh, to, so um, to actual artillery. So most of it yeah. was focused in the DR. All was the DR. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, until the project started, and so um, again, when God, you know, just struck that bus, and yeah. He's like, "You're doing this. Right. It's time to wake up." Mm. Um, it, it still seemed like an impossible task, but yeah. we all felt the the same commission from right. from God. So we just. Uh, First, we had to research <laughs> how do you build a latrine? Yeah. No. What goes yeah. into it? Like, right. I'm now an expert on latrines. Um, <laughs> if you have any questions on the dimensions or how they're ventilated, uh, you'd yeah, be surprised like, the questions you get really from people. That's really awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because there, there is a lot that goes into it. Why do you think they hadn't had them before? Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Um, so, I mean, because you, you know, I think I was talking to someone and they had said, well, it's just a latrine. Why didn't people just dig the holes and make a latrine? I said, no, it's not just a latrine. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it actually is something they didn't mm -hmm. have the skills to do or know how exactly how to do it or have the equipment to right, do it. Exactly. You know, like I think that in uh, sometimes in our own ignorance, we don't realize all that goes into doing things like this. You know, mm. so when I was uh, been talking about the 900 project a lot because I do respect it. I do respect you very much. I respect what you do and your vision. And so I talk about it often, and uh, that was one of the comments. Like, well, they're from Haiti. Don't they know about latrines? Why didn't they just build with latrines? I'm like, really? How are they supposed to do that with their hands? Like, mm -hmm. you know? There were some latrines in the village. I'm sure. Um, but yeah, like the reason we had the 900 project because we thought there was roughly 1,000 families, and only 10% is what the mm -hmm. pastor told us had mm -hmm. latrines. So we right. guessed that it was going to be 900 that we were going to be building. Um, so they knew of latrines, but it's just the fact that a lack of finances and materials yeah, they just right. don't have the the resources right. to build something like that and at the time neither did we so right. we're all learning <laughs> we didn't know right. what we were in for yeah right and I, but i think that's with anything i think that you know do they know how to cook yeah but they don't have the food right mm -hmm. right i mean it's kind of silly to just think that oh well they know how to do it let's just they, they should just do mm -hmm. it it's like no you know they probably know how to sew but they don't have materials to make clothing mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, right? You it's need, just a different you world. need you exactly. Just, it's tough to imagine. Yeah, yeah. I, it is tough stuff. to imagine because I think here we just can walk down the local Walmart or whatever and buy the materials we need and right. yeah. we're good to go, right? Um, but they don't have that, and so um, it's it's pretty fascinating that. I laugh because that probably would have been me, I think, in the beginning. It's, <laughs> it's under the air conditioning, like I don't hear or see anything, <laughs> yep. you know, because I, for years I was always like, I'm not called to missions. Never felt the calling. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm, I'm like, I can't wait to you go back. That. You know, yeah, oh, you it's, so it's amazing. It really is. So, Justin, tell us a little bit about yourself. I don't think that you have been on um, this uh, 900 project from the beginning. Is that correct? So that is, in fact, actually correct because 
my brother was one of the people who went on the project from the very beginning. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so this is my first year going on the project. However, this is not my first missions trip. This is my first international missions trip. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, so what other missions trips have you done? So I've been on two missions trips to Rosedale, West Virginia, and I've also been on a missions trip to Philadelphia. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, that's like the Appalachia Mountains, right, in Virginia? Are you up there in that yeah, area? Yeah, it's okay. in a very big mountain area. So what did you find... Um, like very different or similar to your trip here um, with the 900 project? Well, one thing that I found similar between all the mission trips I've been on is that in all the mission trips we've been serving specifically children, mm. um, which is what we've also done with the 900 project. And the thing is, is that kids are kids no matter where you're from. Mm. So it's, it's definitely good. something that touches my heart. Um, and especially going with the 900 project, I was able to minister to a lot of kids there. Oh, that's good. So um, when you, so that that you found basically the same all the kids whether they're in Philadelphia Virginia or in Haiti still want to be loved and play with and you know and taught right is that what you're saying by you found that commonality yeah that's yeah. absolutely true yeah what did you find different um, between going to let's say Virginia and Haiti I mean obviously the needs are different in these two places mm -hmm. um, we live in the United States which is where um, it's a land of opportunity, so it's, there's a lot more opportunity for kids to be whatever they want or grow up to be who they want to be. But basically, in Haiti, the only difference between that and West Virginia is that they don't have what they want to become who they want to be. Mm -hmm. Rather, they have to actually strive towards working towards it rather than having it handed them on a silver platter. Mm. Did you find that in Appalachia, because I think oh, my husband did a mission trip in Appalachia, um, and he said that, you know, they are also, you know, struggling as well, right? Um, but did they have latrines in Appalachia as well, or did you not see that as much there? Um, they still had certain bathrooms in certain parts of the community. Like, okay. they'd all be able to go to, they had community showers, community bathrooms. Okay. Um, most houses, some of the houses did not have access to latrines, but they still had access in their communities. So did that shock you then going to Haiti, how they didn't have any of that happening? Or did you notice it at all, the lack of? Yes, I did notice this and I was taking into account that the fact that the 900 project has already come in and uh, helped a lot with, with a lot of the latrines there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So looking around and seeing all the latrines there and knowing that most of these were built by the 900 yeah. project. Yeah, and that the, is a cool it, feeling. Yeah, and the impact that it's had in the community. Did your brother going, is, is that what made you want to go? Like, did he come back with stories about the 900 Project, or you just wanted to do something outside of the country? That was part of the reason. Um, additionally, I also, you have to take into effect or account that I'm part of a generation that wants to, that really wants to have change, and saying that there's this amazing opportunity for me to make a change in the world, I wanted to step up and take that opportunity. That's awesome, that really is. And not, not um, not what you see a lot, you know, a lot of teens uh, mm -hmm. running to go to missions, you know. So it is a, a, a really great thing to see that you went. Uh, I thought there was two other teens on the trip uh, with us, and you just don't see that that much. You know, it's like a, it's a lot of adults, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, one of the, the church that I'm a part of, they do have a lot of children go. Um, and I mean children like maybe between the ages of like 12 and 14 mm -hmm. or something like that um, but it is uh, fascinating to me that you're right I think your your generation is trying to do something about the lack of previous generations mm -hmm. which is which is awesome that's good um, so in the first episode um, we talked about your latrine project we talked about your scholarship project um, and we touched a bit on the uh, breadfruit tree project mm -hmm. and I wanted to kind of recap on some of those but the very first project I saw on your website because I'm on there mm -hmm. often <laughs> is the uh, Sumith Jacob Alex Memorial project mm -hmm. um, and I didn't have the pleasure of knowing um, Sumith but I would love for you guys to tell us what Sumith uh, Jacob Alex Memorial project is mm -hmm. do you mind talking about that a little bit sure I'm gonna start take it um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the, uh, so this is obviously a, a memorial project in memory of, of Sumith, and uh, it's, it's just something very dear to our heart. Back in, I believe, uh, 2017, uh, Sumith's brother-in-law, Josh, who's a, a really good friend of ours, um, 
Sumith was uh, Josh's best friend. He ended up marrying Josh's sister. Okay. Uh, so they just were always very close and then became family. And uh, Josh had come on the trip, oh, okay. big supporter of the 900 Project. He came, um, like I said, in 2017. And so he came back home and um, they do a lot of missions in India and okay. his family, um, they have an Indian church that they go to and they just love missions. And um, Josh came back and he was like, you know what, I had an opportunity of seeing another country. Um, so instead of just going back to India, back and forth doing missions, Josh had the opportunity and actually another relative of his, uh, Tom, had the opportunity to come with us that year. And so they came back excited. They loved the trip. They were just so excited to, to come back home and mm -hmm. share it. They shared it at family parties and shared it with Sumith and his wife, uh, Jana. And um, so we were just really excited. That was last summer, last August, um, when they signed up. We had a lot of signups that year. Uh, we almost had 20, 22 people coming. Oh, wow, so it was definitely a lot to organize and get ready. And um, so Josh uh, had expressed such great things about the 900 Project and the trip. So Sumith and his wife, they just got married like that, like probably nine months before. They were going to celebrate their first wedding anniversary um, with us on the trip. And so oh, we were just so excited. Cool. Um, they, they lived, I think, out in Michigan, and they were going to fly in, and we're all going to, you know, go from JFK, and so we're kind of going through all of the um, planning and, and organizing, and, and one night, unfortunately, we get one of those phone calls, and we're like, oh, this isn't good, when you get a phone call really late at night, yeah. and uh, it's Josh, and so he, um, he just had told us that, that Sumith had passed away. And we were just in total shock. This was like five weeks before the trip. Wow. They had their flights. You know, he was just, they were recently married. Him and his wife were coming on the trip. Was that the first time that they were going on the trip? That was their first okay. time. Yeah. So again, they were going to celebrate their wedding anniversary literally on that right. week. And so we got that phone call and we just, we couldn't believe it, right. you know. And um, one of the really um, important things is to just, <clears throat> like remember Sumith because he didn't just pass away like from something that might have been medical or things like that but he was on a boat with his family and his wife and um, when they were on the boat they saw another man drowning just some stranger in, in the um, in a, I believe it was a river um, drowning and the family was there and, and Sumith the kind of guy that he is and he's a, a Christian man a believer he jumped in. He jumped in mm. to save this total stranger. And um, it was just, that was the last thing that he ever did. He, he literally gave up his life, like we talk about in the Bible, like we talk right. about with Jesus, for a friend right. and for even a stranger. And so he jumped in with the intentions of trying to help this man and, and pull him out of the water. And it ended up that both, both, both of them drowned. drowned. Yeah. So... That's very um, sad. Yeah, it, was, it, it reminds it was me really of. Tough. of uh, it, it, it just, I guess it just doesn't shock me that um, that you would have somebody like that going on the trip with you, because I feel like in a way that's what you guys are doing, is jumping into the water to try to save somebody that you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, you guys might be um, at a place now where you've been doing this long enough that it now be feels natural mm. and something that you should be doing but this is not something that everybody does you know what I mean and I think that um, when you're in it as long as you guys have been which is 2012 it's a pretty long time mm. you know um, to to be a part of a project and to to have it be uh, something that you actually are living something that you're actually doing um, kind of becomes who you are right but somebody like me, who's only been there one time, I can tell you that this is not the norm, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, and Sumit sounds like he's not the norm, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so then why, why did the Memorial Project, I, I see why it got started, mm -hmm. but what is the Memorial Project then? So um, Sumit's wife and brother-in-law Josh and their family um, decided that they were going to do something in, in Sumit's name and so they raised um, a ton of money, thousands and thousands of dollars mm -hmm. 
and um, decided they wanted to do something to help out the 900 project and to, to do something in Haiti or, or the Dominican. And so Josh's idea was, Sumith was like a, a superstar athlete, oh, a crazy wow. good basketball player. Um, and so they decided they wanted to do something with sports. And so every time we go down to Haiti, we play soccer with them. You saw, I saw. we're not good. They're very talented and in crazy good shape, <laughs> mm. but their field is also uh, boulders, boulders and, and uneven, and mm -hmm. you got you know some goats running through there, and it's like just a bunch of it's, it's like so a big true. dirt patch. It's so true. Um, I thought you guys were gonna yeah. kill yourselves. <laughs> I was so nervous for you guys. Yeah. My ankle's still a little sore. Yeah. Um, and then in the Dominican side, uh, the DR is known for baseball, and so we always played baseball with the the young kids down there, um, and that field can certainly use some some work and some renovation, so they decided that they're going to raise all this money, and then in Sumit's name, they're going to repair all the issues at the baseball field, wow. and then flatten out and um, make an actual field at the, uh, the soccer field. That would be exciting for yeah, them. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be exciting, because that was a huge piece of land, a huge field. Mm -hmm. It was just terrible to run on, but that's what they use, and I'm surprised they don't like break their ankles all the time on that thing. That was, that it's was, crazy, right? mm -hmm. yeah. But I guess they know it so well, right? They know the terrain pretty well. But even though, I mean, the divots and the the boulders and the, I mean, it was, that was yeah. pretty serious. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, that's a pretty exciting project, though, for another one for the 900 <laughs> project. Um, but, you know, that, um, you know, that's amazing that his wife, even though she hadn't been on the trip, had enough, like, confidence in knowing that you guys were the project to give it to, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that means mm -hmm. the world, I'm sure, to you as well, you know? Did you guys have uh, the opportunity to be friends with Sumit, or? No. No, no. Oh, so you know, because mm -hmm. he lived in Michigan, yeah. right? Yeah, we So it was through Josh, you communicating. said? Communicating. I was communicating with them. Oh, you were, okay. them So you got to know wife. them that way. Yeah, yeah. but, um, you know, and just sometimes I just reread re his uh, stamp form and look at it, and I just, yeah. you know, it's just, he, he really was a man of God, and he served until the end and, and gave, literally gave up his life yeah, for literally. someone else. So it's just such an inspiration, and, and we're just grateful that we're given the opportunity to just um, do this in, in his memory. Yeah, that's amazing. And I was like, um, you know, when I, when I got there and I saw the field, that was one of the things that... Um, that the pastor there was talking to me about because I was looking at the field and I was saying, oh my gosh, do you guys have a clinic just for broken limbs? <laughs> <laughs> it's that bad, yeah. And he's like, no, but uh, and that's what he's um, kind of was the one that brought up the fact that he's looking for a way to get these machines up there yeah. to level mm -hmm. these fields. Um, that's the that's the difficulty that's right now is difficulty. the roads are so bad in Tillery yeah. that just to get the machines up to yeah. that field is the biggest hurdle that we're going through right now. Yeah, I don't even know how he would, how he's, I don't even know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, we barely got up I know, there. we barely got up there with a van, right? And I'm like looking around and I looked at him and I said, um, and, and how? <laughs> he's like, I'm yeah. trying to figure that out right now. So hopefully, he said to me, hopefully when you guys come next year, the project will at least be done or on its way of mm -hmm. be, you know, being done. I'm like, well, that's, that's, that's quick. yeah, I'm looking around going, I, I want to see that because that, that would be incredible mm -hmm. because literally I don't know how we got up there. Yeah. I don't know how we did it. So <laughs> I don't know how they will do it, but I'm sure that they will do it. I mean, and it might be an amazing thing to see if you guys c can work that out somehow to get those machines up there, what more can be done, mm -hmm. right? Um, because then you look at the bigger picture, mm -hmm. right? If you can get machines up there, does that mean then you can pave some roads? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, does that mean you can take some of the boulders out of the way? And I, I don't know. You just never know mm -hmm. what one thing will lead to another. I mean, look right, at you sure. guys. You guys thought 900 latrines and we're out. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lord said no. Yeah. You know? Right? So you just never know how one thing will lead to mm -hmm. the next thing that Absolutely. leads to the next thing. I mean, um, I am grateful to Sumith. I wish myself I would have gotten to know him. And I know that now his legacy will just keep living on and on because mm -hmm. every time th that the people in Tillery or in DR see that their athletic fields are fixed, somebody did that, mm -hmm. you know? And the one in Tillery will be even more impactful because they have nothing right now. 
So at least in DR, we're repairing, which mm -hmm. is important. But in DR, they have, I mean, in artillery, they have nothing, mm. right? It's just a Bamboo, field of boulders uh, yeah. and goats. Yeah. <laughs> that was actually kind of funny. I saw a guy <laughs> with a little rope walking his little goat across the field. I'm like, okay. Yeah, no time out or nothing. Yeah, no I'm time out. You guys kept running around the goat. I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> our only good. shining moment was when Justin scored our only yeah. goal. <laughs> I was <laughs> just going to ask Justin about that. I saw that, Justin. How did you do that? I mean, I played soccer for a couple of years, but I haven't played in a while. <laughs> yeah, but on that field, that, that was, was a disadvantage. Yeah. That was a disadvantage. Was a hill too. I know, I know. I was really happy to see that every one of us got back on the bus without a broken limb. I was mm. super happy about that. I was praying for you guys as you were running. But I was super stoked when I saw you scored. I'm like, what? <laughs> I love it. 900 Project scored one. Yes, yep. They, got, they probably got 25, but we did get the one. <laughs> Give or take, yep. <laughs> <laughs> they were excited about the soccer balls, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, so do you guys do that every time? Do you bring soccer balls and sports equipment up, or is that something that you just started doing? Yeah, um, every year we bring, like we don't try to do a ton of, of handouts, but stuff like that, the soccer mm. balls, baseball equipment to yeah. the Dominican kids. Okay. Um, backpacks for the school children mm -hmm. stuff like that is always um, it's always part of it it's always part of it it's yeah. exciting for the kids it's a big hit mm -hmm. how um, do you guys uh, manage the soccer balls and stuff do you guys give it to like a specific person or how do you do that because I saw the balls and then I didn't see the balls so I wasn't yeah sure I think yeah. we we gave out like one for the game and then we give them to like one of the coaches or oh, the okay. leaders okay because they're always better to have somebody on the yeah, ground I was gonna say you know, you give things out and then it kind of gets crazy. So it goes to the leaders and when they have practices and little games. That's good because that means there's people there's managing order. some stuff. Yeah, yeah there's, there's order. order. Yeah. yeah. You see, and that's what I'm talking about. Like, it doesn't matter where you're from. You, you have intelligence. You have a, a way mm -hmm. of having order. It's not like these people are just walking around disorderly. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You just have to give people the right tools, mm -hmm. right? you know? So... Um, Thank you so much for that part. I am really super excited. So we will be right back with the 900 Project to speak about two more projects that they have going on that we are super excited about. Don't miss it. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me. To the uttermost When I think about the Lord How He picked me up And turned me around How He placed my feet On solid ground When I think about the Lord How He saved me How He raised me How He filled me Turn me around, how 
Welcome back. This is Nina Perez at Straight Talk, No Sugar Added. And we are sitting here with the 900 Project discussing some amazing things that they are doing in Lomo de Cabrera, right? Or Loma de Cabrera, uh, DR, and Tillery, Haiti. So we have just discussed uh, the fact that they had, they had built uh, 900 latrines or 1,286 latrines with the help of the cheerf Cheerful Heart Mission? Yeah, yep. perfect. Oh my gosh, if I could only speak <laughs> English. Um, so we were discussing that and we were discussing some of the uh, challenges and we also discussed the Sumith um, project, which is building um, a field in Tillery, Haiti, and also repairing some fields in uh, the DR. So now we are going to talk about their scholarship project because they also have students that they are giving scholarships to because they don't know when to stop. <laughs> so here we are, and we are going to talk about the scholarship project. And I wanted to know, um, do you have scholarship students on the DR and Tillery side, or just mm -hmm. Tillery, or how does that work? Yeah, so right now we, we do have students on both sides. Okay. Um, we have 10 students that have been chosen from Tillery, Haiti, mm -hmm. um, and most of those students are all going to be going to school. They're in about two years in for teaching, and okay. uh, they're all very motivated to come back to their village and to take what they're learning and to, to really bring it back and just to change that village. That's really great. Mm -hmm. And then we do have five scholarship students on the Dominican Republic okay. side with our, our sister church in Loma. Mm -hmm. And um, I think all five of those are, are girls right now. And uh, they're about two and a half years in as well. Oh, so they started um, almost around the same time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so right after the, the latrine project, um, you know, we had a few, our kids then, and so it was kind of like a project that was manageable. Okay. Uh, it was something that we could still do something that wasn't as big of a scale like the latrines, right. um, but it wasn't doing nothing as well. So in about 2016, 17, we started that, and we okay. got um, just And that's because rolling. you were working on your family, your, your personal yeah, family. Yeah, we, you know, I, I had my sons then, and you know, that those beginning years are very difficult, yeah. but we still felt strongly to, to stay working in the village, and with the corruption in Haiti, with some of the education system, we thought that really educating the teachers and bringing them back would just make a, such a huge difference. But why scholarships? Was that something that um, the pastors there bought up as, as a need, or was it, why, why did that start? I, I remember going in those um, middle years around 2016, and uh, just, thinking what can we do mm -hmm. to help with education because there's kids that there'll be families of seven and the first two kids can go to school and the next two couple kids they can't just can't afford it okay. so education is definitely a huge problem in this specific village mm -hmm. um, but also the teachers there's schools that are public schools um, and if any of that government doesn't pay the teachers they don't show up mm. There's private schools as well where the students and the families have to pay for their kids to go, which is okay. very, difficult very difficult as well because yeah. are you going to pay for school or food? or yeah. Their needs are, are just so much. So with the little money they have, you really need to make a, a decision. But uh, one thing that I don't exactly know where the idea came from, but if we could take those teachers and really give them a formal education of how to learn and how to teach, that it would really affect hundreds of students right. that way. So right. by taking those 10, and on the last trip, we were kind of calling them the disciples of the village because they really can change that village. They can, in a big themselves, way. Themselves, yeah. Education can take you so far, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, um, one, one thing that we actually found out when the first time we were thinking about this project was we were talking to some of the teachers and saying, well, where did you guys get your education to become teachers? They had essentially just graduated from like roughly like a high school level education and then we're just using all the notes that they took throughout their years of school mm -hmm. that's what they then taught from oh. so they didn't have any college education they didn't mm -hmm. have any sort of um, you know resources formal or training. anything like that or formal training mm -hmm. to be like the, legitimate the, teachers so. were those the teachers that you're saying that are in Tillery or is that a norm in Haiti like or are you talking about the DR which one are you Tillery. talking about? Oh, yeah. Tillery okay yeah, yeah was that just happening in Tillery um, that the well at least they were trying I think that they were at sure. least trying to educate right mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting so um, because the I guess the government I guess like here right pays the public school teachers is that how that's run there yeah, very little involvement. right so if the government decides not to pay which happens often mm -hmm. the kids get don't get educated mm -hmm. I guess that's what happens right exactly hmm. um, so 
What have you discovered while trying to help these individuals get educated? Like, because um, you, you're picking uh, 10 random people, right? Or 10 people you don't know, right? Did you guys know these people personally? Personally, no, yeah. but we always go through um, the pastor and the church that we're connected right. with in Tillery, mm -hmm. and they are the ones that have relationships with all the families in the village and okay. shows. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of them are currently teachers in different schools mm -hmm. in the village. And so the they're students? In, the students, oh, yes. I know that. So they, they oh. teach during the week, and then yeah. on Friday they hop on their motorcycles and go down to college for the weekend and then come back home. Um, oh, that's and, how that works. I didn't, yeah. I didn't get that when I was there. Okay. Um, I lost my train of thought. So what are the what are the things <laughs> that you've learned? Like so they so they are all teaching during the week, like a Monday through Friday type of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are. And then they they hop on the on their what to get to school. So with every project that we've done, there's always um, an extra some, project. There's always some complications <laughs> that jump in there. Um, and so we were like, oh, this will be great. We'll send some kids to to college, and you know seems like a pretty simple thing it it's, of course it's never simple right. so we found out after the first they made it through the first year of college they made it through this first year and then we asked them well what kind of difficulties mm -hmm. are you having that we can help with so there were some some good ones mm -hmm. uh, so number one to get from the village of Tillery to school mm -hmm. is a six-hour oh motorcycle ride and not because of distance it's just because the roads are so poor yeah, yeah. that it's it takes forever to go to go that far. Um, so one of the things what, that we did was we bought a few motorcycles for them to be able to, um, I guess, carpool yeah. uh, down to school on, on Fridays. Mm -hmm. and, How and are back. they getting there for that year? Do you know? Um, just borrowing other people's just bikes? Just borrowing other, pe yeah, yeah. other people's motorcycles. Um, and so that was number one. Number two, the six hours, just think about working all week and then having a six hour commute to get yeah. to school, then being at school all weekend and then mm -hmm. a six hour commute home. Yeah, um, and so we tough. were trying to think of how can we help with that. Well, I guess it's a much easier route if you're able to cut through the Dominican and then cut back into, okay. into Haiti. And so that requires, they need their passports, um, which was a much bigger expense than we thought at the time. And it's for all 10? But it's for all mm -hmm. 10, yeah. So now they're able to make that trip and that cut four hours off mm -hmm. their trip. So it's now wow. a two hour commute. Um, oh, that's huge. And it probably is because of the roads too, because the DR has roads. Mm -hmm. They so, have legitimate roads, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's probably sure. what helped a lot, you know, trying to, uh, from going to a rough terrain to actually going to a road. That probably helped smooth things out. Yeah. Um, so, th so did you pick those 10 students from the beginning? Like, did you know it's 10 students, that's what we want? Or did it start off with like two students and then three and then grew? Or how did that? We were essentially introduced to about a dozen students okay. in Tillery. And then the five in the DR, like, that's like our second family down there at this point. And yeah. so we just trust them and said, hey, you guys pick the five and mm -hmm. good to go. Yeah. Um, in Tillery, they, we met with like a dozen of them. They kind of had like a big, like, um, like a little powwow like we had with when you were down there. Mm -hmm. Just sat in a big circle and talked to them and why do you want to be a teacher and, or why do you want to further your education and. Um, kind of like an interview. Kind of like an interview. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so again, we didn't, we kind of got a better idea of who really wanted um, the scholarship and we really thought would come back and pour into to the village more and so we started off with seven in Tillery and then okay. we added on three more mm -hmm. okay. the last year. Oh okay and so that project has been going on since when? When did the scholarship oh, project 16, begin? 16, 17. Oh okay yeah. and then you added the three more so now it's right. 10 and, and is 10 the comfortable number? Yeah. 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 There's always there's always more we want to add. Yeah, of we course. just don't want to overextend ourselves. Of course, and it um, wouldn't be much. wise to do that. Yeah, you know, I think that a lot of times we do want to do more, but you actually shoot yourself in the foot, you know, because mm -hmm. then before you know it, you can't provide for all of them, and yeah. now you're giving everyone less, right? right. So it's uh, sometimes just wiser to to know where you are and know your limit and do it that way. Mm -hmm. So, so some of the challenges from what I hear that you had were transportation, yep. right? Uh, then. Uh, passports <laughs> that's always fun um, and then now they go to school during the weekend so they're educated Friday through mm -hmm. Sunday Friday yeah. Sunday yeah. Oh. is that like a normal college thing or is that just because of what their schedule is or yeah I think it's just because of what their schedule yeah, is okay. just when they're all right and classes. so they so if they have motorcycles I'm assuming that they carpool or bike pool if mm -hmm. you will uh, all of them together 
They yeah. must be close knit because that's a yeah. it's a lot of time to travel back and forth yeah. together, and um, which is good. You know, at least they can support each other. Mm -hmm. And if they're if they're teaching the kids, maybe they and I don't know how they do this, but I'm sure that they're supporting each other with what they're teaching mm -hmm. and stuff, which is great. Yeah. yeah, they are definitely super tight. One of the things that again starting off, there's always going to be some bumps. We found out that. Um, all of them didn't even have books, mm. so they were wow. borrowing each other's books, almost rewriting the entire thing, wow. and sharing notes with each mm. other and whatever. And so another thing that we're adding on now is um, we're trying to get laptop computers for yeah. mm -hmm. for each of them yeah. to then and again yeah. cut down on the difficulties yeah. that they're going to have to to get their right. education. But it, again, it just shows you how hard they want to work and how much they want this. Yeah. The fact that they would go right. through all that just to. Um, and they probably didn't even say anything to you guys at first because they don't want to ruin anything. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So they're probably sitting there like yeah. rewriting and entire the ones textbooks. Really right. You know, doing all the work. You yeah. Know? You could still, you still have to put in all the hard work and the studying and all the work that goes into it. So they really want it and they were really excited when we, every year they seem to be more outgoing. They're able to speak better in, in, in front of a large group. And yeah. They're gaining confidence and they're they're growing and you could see that and yeah. and they're just very grateful and it's just a, a partnership that we want to come alongside them and and work together to to help them. Yeah, that's wonderful, yeah. Justin. I do you know I'm going to come to you, right? I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you, Justin. I want to know because you're a student here in the U.S., right? So this is a different perspective, right? You're going to be going to college soon, and I'm sure that. Um, I don't know. For, for me, uh, I didn't go to college till I was an adult. I, I was able to go to school. But the challenges that they had were so big from, what, from where I was sitting. You mm -hmm. know, like rewriting textbooks and, you know, trying to even, like, hop two and three people on a bike to go. And then trying to, you know, get your passport to go through. And going all week into it's just like, wow. You know, usually I would just make sure I didn't have classes on Friday, so I got my yeah. Friday to myself. You know, it's like it's it's it was pretty mind blowing yeah. to be honest, and it makes you proud of them, super proud. You know, um, how did you feel sitting there and, and listening to them? You know, give uh, what they are give their testimony basically on what they are doing, what they want to do, um, uh, how difficult it is for them, and what they're requesting. What, what were you? What were your thoughts? I mean, just seeing how difficult it was for them to go to school makes me have a new realization for how I should be appreciating school here. Yeah. Um, I go to a high school that's in my town, so I get to take a bus to the school. Right. Not only that, they have computers for every student mm -hmm. at the school that we can borrow if wow. needed. So it's a very different aspect um, of life. Yeah. And hearing the stories makes me really want to go into the school year going extra hard and trying harder because I have the resources available yeah. to do well. That's good, and that's wise, right? I think that um, I was telling my grandson that because he was asking me about my trip. He's only 10. But I was, he was like, oh, I don't want to go to school. You don't start complaining about going mm -hmm. to school next week. And I said to him, you don't realize how blessed you are mm -hmm. that you're going to a really good public school, you know, that mommy drops you off at every day and picks you up at every mm -hmm. afternoon, and you get lunch, and you get a snack time, mm -hmm. like, you know, and I started explaining to him how what the kids have to go through, and they struggle. He was wow, and I'm like exactly. So appreciate that you're having this basically free education mm. for him anyway, and for his family, right? Because it's public yeah. school. Thank goodness we have it. Um, but to hear the stories in Tillery um, and in and in the DR, um, they work hard too. You know, it's they sure. just they want this. Mm -hmm. They want this, Absolutely. and that and that gives you kind of like. Um, uh, inspiration that they're gonna do something with this that they're not just going like you know some of uh, the college students here that go to college and mm. then they decide eh, I don't want to do it you know yeah. I don't want to do yeah. anything you know play it's video just games like, instead. what's that <laughs> I want to play video games yeah instead. exactly exactly like did you just spend like seven years in school <laughs> to do nothing uh, but that's what happens yeah. I think we take for granted for all sure. the options that we have we just have way too many options you know um, even going to the grocery store I'm thinking to myself I have so many options. I have so many options, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And, and yet you complain about the one product you can't find because it's your favorite product. Yeah. It's so silly. <laughs> it just changed everything for me. It did. It changed everything. I want to know what's the most rewarding thing for you guys? What, let's start with you. What's the mm -hmm. most rewarding thing about doing these scholarship projects? Doing scholarships? Yeah. Uh, I would say 
this year in particular is I really saw the growth, like I was saying earlier. Because yeah. um, year one, we were kind of all sitting in a circle, but it was like really awkward and, you know, we were kind of talking and obviously there's a translator and things like that. But every year, you know, they're opening up more and, you know, we're just giving each other hugs when we get there. It's mm -hmm. like now we know each other, we trust each other. Okay. They know that we've come through with, so you saw with our end. Happening. And like yeah. I said before, they, they're really growing and they're excited to come back and teach. And not only at school, but they all have brothers and sisters and they're sharing this journey. And I, I just love to encourage them because I'm a teacher myself, right. that they're really changing generations. And hopefully the kids now can be like, I want to go to college. Right. I want to do what they're doing. So whether it's through us or just through more opportunities for them, you know, I just hope the the younger generation can can that's aspire goal, to be right? like them. I, mean, I yeah. think that's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. Is to inspire the next generation. Right, right. right. That's how you change the whole trajectory of that area, right? Mm -hmm. It's the next generation lifting them up so that they can move right, forward. Exactly. Do you feel the same way? Yeah. That's it's certainly the hardest thing to explain to people when you're trying to fundraise or something like this is like in America, there's certainly people that are in you know, difficult circumstances in America. But as far as college goes, like if you want to go to college, you can take out loans, you can go to community college, you can go to, there's other routes you can go to get an education. You can go online. Um, right. There's a million different paths you That's can take. So, true. Mm -hmm. so education is available to the vast majority of people. And so when you say, well, we're giving scholarships to these kids in Haiti and the DR, um, they kind of assume it's like a similar situation down right. there. If they didn't receive these scholarships, they wouldn't go to college. Exactly, that's so there's good, no, that's good. There's no opportunity for them to go yeah. to college. Mm -hmm. And so when we first kind of introduced the project, you can like see the, you could see the spark in the pastor's eyes mm -hmm. in Tillery, just the fact that he was gonna be able to offer this opportunity to a few of his, um, the students in his, in his church. Um, it's, it's interesting because you're not just giving an education to 15 mm -hmm. kids. The trickle down exactly. effect to yeah. Yeah. their, you know, like yeah. Sherry was saying, to their siblings and to their classes who they're now better equipped to teach and whatever. It cha and it also gives hope to people and the younger students that maybe someday I get to go to college. Maybe mm -hmm. I can work hard enough to get one of these scholarships. Yeah, it's cool. So yeah. it, it does. It changes like the the whole vibe of mm -hmm. the education. It gives hope. There. It gives hope. It gives yeah. hope, and hope is. Huge. Huge yeah, when you are in a place where it seems hopeless, mm. right? Hope is huge, mm -hmm. and um, you know you're changing them ten at a time, right? Or fifteen at a time, I should say. And you're right, Matt. That was a really powerful statement, and it's very true. You know, if they don't get these scholarships, they don't go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we need to like really focus on. You yeah, know, because absolutely. a lot of times we just think, well, then we don't. They're not going to scholarship. No. If they don't get mm -hmm. a scholarship, they do not go. It's like that dire, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, okay, we only have a few minutes, but I want to end with the major project because this is really um, heavy on my heart, and I think that a lot of people that I've spoken to are also very excited to know more about it, and it's the breadfruit tree project. So I want to know more about the project. What, what, um, what is the goal? What have we done so far? What do you want to what do you want to do? What is mm -hmm. what's the what are we doing? Talk to me. Uh, bread so fruit tree. Bread yeah, the, the tree. breadfruit tree <laughs> campaign just it really is less than a year old. Came from last year's trip, and um, within the twelve months, you know, we have received uh, six hundred trees already that have been delivered. They've actually been planted. That's we got to awesome. plant some on last our trip. Last time we spoke, you didn't even have those yet. Right. This so is that great. was that was uh, huge. Uh, pretty quick. And um, our goal is 5,000 trees for the village. And um, so just to have 600 in the ground is great because the, the sooner that we can get them and get them in the ground, the sooner they'll grow. But just really excited to see literally the growth of them, but also the village to, to be able to pro provide that food for, right. you know, hundreds of years, really. Right. So it's not, although there's a three year wait for the fruit, it, it's going to be um, just another yeah, avenue of exactly. hope. Yeah. And you know what? It's, it's, um, it, it might seem long, like you say, oh, it's three years of growth, but honestly, if they were never planted, 
it would never be even mm -hmm. three years, right? right. So, mm -hmm. the, I mean, we have to start somewhere is what I'm mm -hmm. trying to say. So you have 600 on, in the ground, mm -hmm. and um, we want, uh, I guess, 5,000, but if we get more, then that'd yeah. be awesome, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the goal is 5,000. And you know what I think, uh, more than just it being a, a small little breadfruit tree being planted, to me as I was there and watching this happening, was the fact that we're giving a village hope because you're planting a tree that actually is going to produce, I think it's 750 pounds of food mm -hmm. or fruit a year. Yeah. And um, I, didn't, I didn't know how you guys were gonna do that, but I realized that you're giving it per family. Mm -hmm. Are you giving it to families, is that right? Yeah. So each family's property will have like two or three trees and then okay. we're gonna have like a, a grove in a certain section near the river. Okay. And, mm -hmm. um, our guys down there kind of have a, a plan as they to how they want to spread them out. That's um, awesome. And so the trees themselves are not the, the difficult part of coming across. Like we partnered with um, Trees That Feed, another organization down there mm -hmm. who does this like all over the world. They grow the trees up to a certain height and then we take them there and to wherever oh, and, wow. and plant them. Um, it's the transportation. Yeah. So just like the, the scholarship kids were struggling with that, mm -hmm. just imagine a truck with 300 trees on the back of it trying to get up yeah. these, these yeah. brutal roads. And so, um, just another small roadblock that <laughs> we're gonna break right through. <laughs> but there's no roads. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, poor analogy when there's no roads. Um, That's so funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you're right. And uh, I, I hope that we can help um, in, a, in any way that we can, anybody watching, anybody listening to this, help in any way of giving the finances that are needed to go and get these trees, because that's what it is, right? It's, it's the actual transporting of these trees, mm -hmm. getting the fertilizer for these trees, mm -hmm. right? And I believe mm -hmm. you have on your website getting, educate, getting educated yeah. on how to take care of mm -hmm. them, because you don't want to give a tree and it dies. I mean, that would be such a shame, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, but I know that these um, breadfruit trees um, uh, in Puerto Rico, I think we call them mapeng or pana, um, and uh, they grow, the, the fruit is like huge. Mm -hmm. And you know, to, to have, and I love that you said that, I didn't know about the grove thing, but that's, that's really awesome because um, that, that means that more people can have food, right? Mm -hmm. Like not just the families that have the trees, but if there's people out there who don't, aren't mm -hmm. part of that family or don't have and can go to get a fruit up th off the grove is yeah. huge, sure. it's huge. Yeah, that is you one know? of the questions you get from a lot of people is, well, who's gonna you know guard the trees and whatever? This is like a isolated village. It's like a tight knit yeah. community. And mm -hmm. of course there's gonna be, you know, some bad seeds that here and there, but like they watch they out respect, for each other yeah, and they yeah, respect each respect. other and so, um, they're excited for it, as excited as we are. Well, I mean, you planted a tree, you planted hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the truth, you know, because uh, like I, for me, I was super stoked, you know, to see them going in the ground. Um, because I'm like, wow, this, you know, when a seed uh, drops into the ground and dies, it grows another tree, mm -hmm. you know? So like, you just keep thinking about the changes in the trajectory of this entire village. It's not just a tree, right? Mm -hmm. But one tree can produce hundreds of more mm -hmm. trees. Right, Absolutely. so that's just, I just can't tell you how excited I am about that. But that's okay, we'll move on. Um, so I wanna know how people can get involved and help. How can people get involved and help with the 900 Project? What, what does the 900 Project need from, from people who are viewing? What do we need? Um, well, I would say, obviously, um, one of the things that helps the project go is just the financial commitments. Right. Uh, some people choose to, to purchase a tree, which is around $75. Um, some people choose to do like a monthly donation. And um, the, the donations go 100% to the 900 Project and to the scholarships and to uh, the Breadfruit Campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just really excited. We're just really looking for maybe monthly partners, mm -hmm. even if it's $25 a month or $40 a month, whatever every, you know that specific person or family can afford. Mm -hmm. um, but just partnering up, you know, and um, just really working together. Um, another thing that Matt had stated earlier is that we are looking for any kind of laptop or computers um, to bring to the scholarship students. We are looking to hopefully bring you know new Chromebooks or laptops to them so that's one of our 
our goals so, but as you well. Don't, you don't need the actual laptop. You need the finances to help with the laptop, right? Or do you need the actual laptop? No, what I'm saying by that is that you don't want people just dropping off use laptops to your house, right? Yeah, <laughs> no. I mean, we have, right? You have to be specific. Have you're you're from, over here yeah. saying laptops. People are going to be like, hey, I have this Dell from like yeah. 1996. One in there. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's super heavy. <laughs> uh, we do have specific links that yeah. we okay. would like to get them all the same ones um, on both sides so that, okay. um, you know, they all, all oh, share so that. So you're saying, yeah, please share that. I will mm -hmm. add that also okay. to, um, to this segment because I'd like... Um, for people to be able to either click on there and purchase it mm -hmm. for you and, and send it to you or send mm -hmm. you the money of what it is. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not that much um, yeah. from what I saw on the links. And yeah, one thing with that is there's just, they have so much pride and dignity and in their education. And yeah. um, on the Dominican side, they're really just using their phones and trying to type out papers and, right. and do their work. They have the heart and the work ethic. Right. It's just they like you were tools. saying, it's the tools. They and, need the tools. You know, so we just want to equip them to be the most successful that they can. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I think another way we can all help is spreading the word. Letting mm -hmm. people know that the 900 project is out there. Do you hear me, Justin? You gotta tell some people. Um, we gotta tell people about it because um, I think it's the only way to really get you guys out there, right? Is mm -hmm. to hopefully I, I share this segment in all of my social media, but I want people to like really start talking about, you know, basically adopt a tree. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. it's if it's only seventy five dollars, you can probably get a few of them for your family. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can donate that way. You can donate monthly on your mm -hmm. website. You said right. Yeah. Um, you can uh, go on there. Now, are the links for the computers on there? Or no, no? I could I could add okay. those for sure. Yeah, that'd be great. And you know, one of the last things is just prayer. Yeah, you that's know, good. keep praying for all these roadblocks or um, issues that that come up with dealing with other countries and things like that. But we know that God has provided all the way through, so uh, we're just excited to be That's part of so the journey. Great. Yeah, me too. I'm excited to be part of the journey, and I can't wait to keep doing this journey with you guys. I'm not off my high yet, Matt. <laughs> so um, I'll let you know if I ever get off, but I don't think I'm going to. Good. It's my first mission trip and the one I love the most um, and the one I think that really spoke to me the most. I think God had me wait this long because mm. this was the one, you know? So thank you guys so much for being here. Sherry, Matt, Justin, thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Again, this is Nina Perez at Straight Talk, No Sugar Added. You make sure you get onto the 900project.org. You better give some money. I'm watching you. <laughs> um, donate, you know, and buy a tree, uh, buy a couple of trees, laptop computers that the students need. So I thank you so much for everything that you are doing. I hope that you share this with a lot of people. Please um, share away this video, but also share everything that they're doing at the 900project.org. Thank you so much. Until next time. <laughs>